Hey everyone, Noah, I'm here with an exciting announcement. You ready for it? Well, here it is. I have a new podcast. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm still doing Unpacking Israeli History. It's my baby, it really is. But I'm not only passionate about Israeli history and the Israeli people and the Israeli story. I've always been drawn to Jewish thought. It's how I originally became an educator, actually. I spent years developing curriculum in so many different areas. And don't worry, this podcast is not just me. In this new podcast, Wondering Jews with Michal and Noam, my brilliant and incredible co-host, Michal Biton, and I will be thinking about, discussing, and hopefully lovingly disagreeing with one another about the latest news about the Jews. Can't wait for it. So check it out. Subscribe to Wondering Jews with Michal and Noam right now on your favorite podcast app. Do it. Do it right now. Do it right now. And guess what? I'll see you there. Or you'll see me there. Hey, I'm Noam Weissman, and you're listening to Unpacking Israeli History, the podcast that takes a deep dive into some of the most intense, historically fascinating, and often misunderstood events and stories linked to Israeli history. Welcome to Season 5. This episode of Unpacking Israeli History is generously sponsored by Dorit Naftalin and Harry Nelson, and Barbara Summer and Alan Fisher. Before we start the season, I gotta say, I just want to talk to you. So, I know I sound desperate and not cool and... It really makes me feel vulnerable, but email me. Shoot me a note at noam at jewishimpact.com. So many of you have reached out, and it's so great to continue the conversation with me, with my producer, Rifki, and it's just so much fun. Okay, thank you. Yalla, let's do this. <laughs> We, the people of Israel, are prepared and anxious to meet the representatives of our neighbors without any preconditions. There are people in Israel and elsewhere say it's impossible to make peace between the Arabs and Israel or the Jewish people. I think they're wrong. I'm a dad and a nerd and I host a history podcast. So you know I love a dated reference, which might explain why I'm opening this episode with an Israeli pop song from two decades ago. The pointed social commentary funk band Hadag Nachash seems doomed to be eternally relevant. Seriously, check them out. We've linked some cool stuff in the show notes, and one of their lead guys, Sha'anan Street, is seriously cool. Their 2003 song Misparim, Numbers, catalogs some of Israel's most relevant stats, including a number that is deeply, tragically familiar to Jewish people everywhere. Translated, that means something like the biggest number till today that embodies the hope yet illustrates the catastrophe is the number that makes every sane person stand still. Six million. Okay, sounds a lot better in Hebrew, but even in English, the message is powerful. Because every Israeli, and I'd wager most Jewish people, knows what this number means. One third of global Jewry erased in under a decade. This kind of collective remembering isn't an accident and it isn't spontaneous. Jewish institutions, including the Israeli government, have gone to great lengths to cultivate a collective Holocaust consciousness. And I'm prepared to bet that many of you listening have been on the receiving end of those efforts. That you've been to a Holocaust museum at least once, or heard a survivor give a speech, or maybe even visited a death camp. And yet, I feel reasonably confident that if I asked your average, affiliated, hate that term, Jewish millennial what they know about the Holocaust, few would mention John Demyanyuk. And if I asked 100 people about the famous trial where Israel tried a Nazi war criminal, 99 of them would mention Eichmann, not Demyanyuk. And it's fair. I mean, I hadn't heard of him until 2019 when Netflix released a documentary series called The Devil Next Door. And I do Jewish education for a living. I really recommend that documentary, by the way. It was a helpful resource for our team as we put together this episode. And I'm incredibly glad that Netflix dragged the whole affair back into the spotlight. Because like its much better known counterpart, the Eichmann trial, this almost forgotten episode of Israeli history ignited an incredibly important conversation 
about Holocaust consciousness, memory, forgiveness, and justice. Why does this story matter, especially in an episode of a show about Israeli history? And to get inside my head, one thing I kept wondering about is, in researching and thinking about John Demyanyuk and his trial, what really is justice? One more introductory note for me as we get into the story. My psyche is divided in half. Half of me is energized to tell the story. The Holocaust has caused inner turmoil of epic proportions from generations of people. Holocaust movie after Holocaust movie is produced. Trips to Holocaust museums are mandatory in some places, and Holocaust education remains critical to understanding Jewish identity today. And yet, and yet, how sad this is. Not just because shaping an identity that's based on how others perceive of you and how others treat you is the surest way to insecurity, and not just because a positive affirmation, a positive identity that is not morbid or death-centered is so much, well, healthier, but also because there is much of Jewish history that is not merely defined by non-Jews hating Jews. And when we focus exclusively on the Holocaust or anti-Semitism, I think it misses part of the picture. And therefore, part of our identities are not formed in healthy or complete ways. I hope that made sense, and I think it's worth keeping in mind. But for now, let's get to the story of an ordinary Joe, or ordinary John, in this case. Like many other immigrants in his town of Seven Hills, Ohio, Demyanyuk worked at the Ford Auto Plant, attended Ukrainian church with his family, was generally considered a good neighbor and a stand-up guy, so it came as a shock to his friends and family when the United States government filed proceedings against him in 1977 to strip him of his American citizenship. Their grounds? John, formerly known as Ivan, had lied on his citizenship application. Now that's already a major no-no. You really shouldn't lie to the United States government. It's just a generally a bad idea. Especially not about being in the SS. That's right. The U.S. government alleged that mild-mannered John, the immigrant success story, the American every man, had served as an SS guard in a number of Nazi camps during World War II. And the survivor testimony about his behavior there was blood-curdling. But before we get there, quick nerd corner. You've heard the term SS, or Schutzstaffel? The SS was originally established as Adolf Hitler's personal bodyguard unit and became an elite part of the Nazi Reich. But it would later become specifically charged with the implementation of the final solution, i.e. the murder of European Jews. Okay, now back to Demyanyuk. See, something uh, I interesting happened. See, usually when a denaturalized citizen gets deported, they get sent back to their country of origin. Makes sense, right? But not Demyanyuk. Because for the first time ever, the state of Israel made a special request of the U.S. government. Send him to us. We've got some unfinished business. And the United States agreed. That's how John Demyanyuk ended up on a plane to Israel on February 27th, 1986. And by the way, if you caught the nine-year delay from the U.S. deciding to strip him of American citizenship to when he was actually extradited to Israel, sharp ear. So why the heck did it take so long? Well, after the U.S. decided to extradite Demyanyuk to Israel, his defense team raised complicated legal challenges, not to mention the delicate political and diplomatic complexities that the U.S. had to dance around. Anyway, the 66-year-old spent the next year in solitary confinement at the Ayalon prison, waiting for his trial to begin from the start. He and his family vigorously maintained his innocence. They spent months searching for an Israeli attorney to join his defense team, but no one, no one wanted that case, except for one guy, Yoram Sheftel. I'm going to play you a couple of clips from The Devil Next Door, because Sheftel might just be the most outrageous character we've ever featured on the podcast, which is saying a lot, by the way. So I want to let him speak for himself. There is a Yiddish expression uh, called Aftzeluch Hezdiker. It's a person that refuses 
to obey the general norms, uh, to behave exactly as expected, a troublemaker. And you enjoy being in this? Uh, yes, yes. I don't have uh, to put too much effort uh, towards it. It's come out of me naturally. As you might imagine, this flavor of troublemaking, defending a Nazi accused of almost cartoonish sadism, didn't earn Sheftel any admirers in Israel. Eli Gabay, one of Demyanik's prosecutors, said of Sheftel, He embodied, for me, a traitor. Israeli reporter Noah Klieger, who covered the trial, agreed, I can't tell you what I think about Sheftel, because he'd sue me immediately, but I'm sorry that there are Jews like Sheftel. And that's why when I texted my friend Donnie Ross to check out this documentary, he texted me, This guy is the worst person on earth. Donnie was so disturbed, he followed up with this. That's one of the most horrible things ever learnt about or seen. There is something very wrong with you, Noam. Thanks, Donnie. Now, Donnie is wont to exaggerate, but I want to reiterate how wild that is. He wasn't saying that the SS guard was the worst person on earth. He was saying that Sheftel, the lawyer defending him, was. And it was bad enough that Sheftel was defending an SS guard. But the accusations against him, Yannick, were harrowing. The trial opened on February 16, 1987, and it's hard to describe what a big deal it was. It was the first fully televised trial in Israel. Not only was everyone in Israel watching, everyone had an opinion. Each side presented a wildly different and sometimes inconsistent version of events. But the prosecution's case shocked the nation because its key witnesses had been victims, they claimed, of Demyanyik's brutality, and their stories were beyond imagination. So what do we know? Everyone, including Demyanyik himself, agrees that he served in the Soviet army until he was captured by the Germans in 1942. And that's where the stories begin to diverge. Because Demyanyik claims that he spent the rest of the war as a POW, suffering along with all the rest of the prisoners in a German concentration camp. But others who were there, fellow Soviet POWs, SS guards, and Jewish prisoners alike, tell a very different story. They contend that Demyanyik was no mere POW, that he volunteered to join the SS, who were only too happy to accept a Soviet recruit. By 1942, when Demyanyik was taken prisoner, the Nazi regime had already begun implementing Operation Reinhardt, a remarkably bloodless name for their plan to murder every single Jew in German-occupied Poland. It was for this person that they built the three death camps of Belzic, Treblinka II, and Sobibor. Nerd Corner Alert. You may have heard of Sobibor, or at least the incredibly powerful Holocaust movie, Escape from Sobibor. But you may not remember that Sobibor was a particularly horrific death camp in which more than 160,000 people were killed over only two years. That's just under 250 people a day, which is honestly hard for me to wrap my mind around. At the end of the war, only about 50 people total survived Sobibor. And Sobibor, Belzic, and Treblinka too. Well, it's weird to think about the logistics in the face of this sort of death. But to run places like that, you need overseers. You need guards. You need people to power the machinery of death. People like Demyanyuk. According to the prosecution, he learned how to be an SS guard at Troniki a concentration camp turned SS training ground. And then, depending on who's telling the story, he was sent to work at Flossenburg, or Sobibor, or Majdanek, or some combination. According to survivors, Demyanik later ended up at Treblinka, a labor camp that expanded into an extermination center in 1942. If you want to be technical about it, Treblinka was a labor camp. Treblinka too was the death camp. Its only purpose was killing people, mostly, but not exclusively Jews from Warsaw and the surrounding areas. But even a death camp needs forced labor, right? Someone to welcome new arrivals and confiscate their valuables. Someone to sort through these stolen goods and send them off to Germany. Someone to clean out the boxcars that brought thousands upon thousands of terrified Jews to the doors of hell and prepare each train for the next transport. Someone to herd prisoners towards the quote-unquote showers and haul their bodies out to the crematoria once the gas did its job. These jobs fell to Sunder Commandos, 
Jews forced to burn the bodies of their friends and neighbors and loved ones. I don't believe there's a hierarchy of suffering. I really don't think that way. That one group of Holocaust victims had it worse than another. But I will say this. Sandra Commandos experienced a unique and particular kind of horror. The horror of being forced to participate in the systemized genocide of their own people before they too were murdered and replaced with new arrivals. It was these Sunder Commandos who testified to Demyanyik's legendary cruelty at Treblinka. Jewish prisoners knew their SS guards only by their first names or their nicknames. They didn't know the name Demyanyik. They knew only that the guard with the harsh face and the cruel eyes was named Ivan. Their nickname for him was Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible, after the brutal 16th century Russian Tsar. Pinchas Epstein was only 17 years old when he was forced to become a Sonder Commando, removing corpses from the gas chambers to the crematoria. This is his testimony. I saw a large man and he was operating the engine. Afterwards, they ordered us to open the doors and take out the corpses. This Ivan would come out of the engine room and beat us terribly with his pipe. Sometimes he would carry a sword and he would crush skulls, cut ears, and torture the prisoners. It was unbelievable. Your honors, we took out corpses. It was horrific to see. People with crushed faces, people with knife wounds, pregnant women stabbed in the gut, people with eyes poked out. There are no words. I remind you, this was broadcast all over Israel. How could the public tear themselves away? And how could they not believe the survivors? How could they not hate Demyanyuk and everything he represented? Nearly one million Jews and an unknown number of others were murdered at Treblinka. Fewer than 70 Jews survived. Fewer than 70! Survivor after survivor pointed to Demyanyuk as Ivan the Terrible. And still he proclaimed his innocence, even trying to shake one survivor's hand. The survivor, a former Sonder Commando at Treblinka named Eliel Rosenberg, shouted, How dare you, murderer! And most of the courtroom followed suit. Think about who was sitting there. People who had seen and survived the worst moment of Jewish history. They wanted justice for their murdered mothers and fathers, their siblings, their children, their neighbors, and spouses and friends. They wanted justice for an entire vanished world. And all their anger, all their grief, all their horror and trauma and loss focused on the portly 60-something who sat impassively in the courtroom listening to a simultaneous Ukrainian translation of the proceedings through a large pair of headphones. Of course he was a murderer, this placid monster who showed not a whit of emotion as survivors detailed his atrocities. Demyanyuk's defense team didn't help his image. His American lawyer Mark O'Connor shared a deep and mutual loathing with the three judges presiding over the case. He'd even asked the judges to disqualify themselves, kind of an odd choice for a person trying to save his client from the death penalty. But perhaps worst of all, O'Connor had dared to ask Rosenberg why he, a Sonder commando, who knew that new arrivals were being herded to their deaths, never helped or warned them. Rosenberg, and I'd wager the entire Israeli public, seemed shocked by the question, finally shouting, Don't ask me, ask him. Ask him what he would have done to me if I had tried. It was a tasteless question, but it was also a sign of how far the Israeli public had come. You might remember from our Eichmann, Kastner, and German reparations episodes that early Israelis had a complicated relationship to the Holocaust. And if you don't remember those episodes, go back and listen. The link for you in the show notes. For the first decade of Israel's existence, too many Israelis viewed Holocaust survivors with disdain, maybe even cruelty at times. At worst, they were accused of horrifying things. How was it possible that out of 6 million, they survived? What did they do? Who did they collaborate with? Who did they sell out? That was the context of the Kasser trial of 54, when it was the presiding judge, Benjamin Halevi, who posed the unanswerable questions to survivors. Back in 54, it was almost as though Israel was putting survivors on trial. But 33 years later, at the Demyanyuk trial of 1987, the state seemed to concentrate all its pain and trauma on a single SS guard, a sadistic, 
but ultimately minor player in the wider story of the Holocaust. In so many ways, the case symbolized an evolution in how Israelis thought about the Holocaust. They weren't ashamed of their survivors. They were fiercely protective. They wanted the entire world to know that 40 years on, the wound hadn't healed. Might never heal. The prosecution called survivor to survivor to the stand. Their testimony was raw and impassioned and powerful, but it was also sometimes inconsistent. Humans are unreliable narrators at the best of times. Remembering is an imperfect process, but the survivors on the stand weren't recalling the best of times. They were elderly people reaching back over 40-something years to excavate the worst moments of their lives. Their memories may have been entirely accurate, or they may have been twisted and curdled by trauma and pain. And perhaps that's why one survivor, when asked how he traveled from Poland to Florida, responded, by train. Perhaps that's why Eliyahu Rosenberg, who stared into Demyanyuk's eyes and swore they were the cruel, flat eyes of Ivan the Terrible, had once sworn that Ivan had been killed during a 1943 prisoner uprising. Sheftel, smelling blood in the water, seized on these inconsistencies and ran, and the Israeli public hated him for it. They called him a capo, a collaborator, a sympathizer, and Sheftel's attitude did nothing to help his case or his clients. He repeatedly referred to the trial as a show, and to this day, he mocks the witnesses called to the stand. Some of the witnesses were liars. Some of the witnesses were senides. And some of the witnesses were senides and liars. Yikes. But the survivors weren't the only ones who offered inconsistent testimony. Because each time Demyanik took the stand, his story seemed to change. He was in a POW camp the whole time. No, he was in Sobibor. No, he meant he was working on a farm at Sobibor as a prisoner of war. No, he had once had an SS tattoo marking his blood type. Did the court want to see before he got it removed? Sheftel plotzed as his client incriminated himself repeatedly. And to this day, he still refers to Demyanyuk as an ignorant peasant. The prosecution, on the other hand, was having a field day. And so was the public. It was one thing for an aging survivor to misremember a detail, but a Nazi's ever-changing stories were clearly proof of guilt. So what happened? The judges handed down their decision on April 25th, 1988. The verdict? Guilty. The sentence? Death. Like Eichmann, Demyanik was a symbol of evil, and though his death couldn't undo a single thing, it could perhaps nudge the balance of the universe ever so slightly towards justice. Across Israel, survivors cheered and cried, even one of the judges teared up. Demyanyuk, seeming to show emotion for the first time, crossed himself repeatedly, looking shell-shocked. But that's not the end of the story. It takes a long time to put someone to death. Demyanyuk was sentenced in April of 1988, then sent back to solitary, where he could hear workers constructing the gallows from which he'd hang. Meanwhile, his family and defense team prepared to appeal. You see, Demyanik was still awaiting his fate in the winter of 91 when the Soviet Union dissolved. And with its collapse came a stream of previously undiscovered documents, statements from SS guards that the Soviet Union had tried and sentenced. Many mentioned a particularly cruel guard named Ivan, but his last name wasn't Demyanik, it was Marchenko. And each description of him varied wildly. Was he tall, short, brown eyes, gray, blue? Was John Demyanyuk Ivan Marchenko? It was this question that anchored Demyanyuk's appeal. The lack of concrete and consistent evidence. The unreliability of witnesses. No one doubted that Demyanyuk had been an SS guard, or even that he had done bad things. But was he this particular SS guard? Was he being put on trial for being a terrible person? Or for being Ivan the Terrible? The five Israeli Supreme Court judges who investigated Demyanyuk's appeal were unanimous. Demyanyuk was an SS guard, and he was terrible. He may have even been the terrible SS guard that haunted Treblinka survivors so many years later. But they just didn't know for sure. And so, in July of 1993, more than five years after Demyanyuk's original sentence, the Israeli Supreme Court handed down 
a 405 page decision overturning his prior conviction. This is nuts. There was enough reasonable doubt about his identity that they simply could not convict him. And so, after years in solitary confinement on the Israeli equivalent of death row, Demyanyuk was a free man. The survivors who had testified against him were crushed. Can you imagine? Somehow justice had slipped through their fingers. If Demyanyuk wasn't Ivan the Terrible, as they had said, then what did that say about their memories, their experiences? A denial of the pain caused is often more painful than the pain itself. After hearing the judge's decision, survivor Yosef Charity told reporters, I am in shock, great shock. The justice has made a mistake. They have done an injustice to millions. They tell me I am not authentic. I wonder if it was worthwhile at all to survive the camps. The six million buried in Europe will ask me, what did you do for us, Yosef Cherny? And I'll say to them, I did my best. Because ultimately the judges and the public had two very different directives. In the words of Mordechai Kremnitzer, then head of the Hebrew University Law School, we don't make a decision about the historic truth. All we do is make a decision about the legal truth. This is the legal truth and not more. Survivors and the wider public cared about the historic truth, and the Israeli courts could have easily fallen into that same trap, convicting Demyanyuk on the basis of, well, being a Nazi. And maybe that's what they would have done if the trial had taken place earlier, in 1950 instead of 1993. But the Israel of 1993 didn't need to convict and punish Demyanyuk for being a Nazi. The entire world had heard the survivor testimony. The entire world knew about the atrocities of the Holocaust. More importantly, Israelis heard. Israelis knew. Israelis were acutely conscious of the legacy of trauma. I have to say, for me, this is really important and really hard. Whether we like it or not, the Holocaust and the Jewish state are inextricably linked. I do not subscribe to the notion that Israel exists because of the Holocaust. It always makes me cringe when I hear it. But I very much so subscribe to the idea that if there were already in Israel, there really wouldn't be a Holocaust. And that is why these trials take on a national consciousness. So the very fact that the Israeli justice system let him go free because of an element of doubt says a heck of a lot about how the Israeli legal system works. So back to Demyanyuk. Sending one elderly Nazi to the gallows might have felt besides the point. Could a single elderly Nazi's death ever even the scale? How to measure one brutal but ultimately bit player against six million deaths? It wouldn't be enough. Nothing could ever be enough. Israeli journalist and historian Tom Segev told the press in 1993, it's a great day for the system. Yet at the same time, a man who had been declared a war criminal gets to go free. And that makes everyone feel uneasy. And I gotta tell you, I'm uneasy with the Demyanyuk verdict too. A big part of me thinks, who cares if he was Ivan the Terrible or just a terrible dude named Ivan? His behavior was terrible, evil. One less Nazi in the world could only be a good thing. But the other, more rational part of me reminds me that emotion and historical memory and even human morality are the purview of the legal system. That it's a good thing that the Israeli Supreme Court overturned the conviction. That as much as it hurt, the court simply was not willing to sentence a man to death on sketchy evidence. So after nearly a decade in an Israeli prison, Demyanyuk was free. But that's also not the end of the story. Demyanyuk returned to the US where he fought for five years to restore his citizenship. He won his case in 1998, only to be stripped of his citizenship a second time in 2002 on grounds that he had been an SS guard at Traniki and Sobibor and Majdanek and Flossenburg, if not at Treblinka. Once more, he was deported from the US, this time to Germany, where he'd stand trial as an 89-year-old for crimes committed in his 20s. Demyanyuk had spent most of his life fighting, and now he was fighting the German government, protesting that he was too old 
and sick to stand trial. And you know, just Google pictures of Demjanic on trial in Germany. He looked sad, pathetic. He was almost 90, couldn't walk or even stand. He entered court in either wheelchairs or a hospital bed. And according to his family and lawyers, he was also living with severe mental ailments. But the trial carried on. 16 months later, Demjanic was convicted and sentenced for the last time. He'd worked as an SS guard. He'd been an accessory to thousands of deaths, specifically 28,060 murders. For his crimes, he'd served five years in prison. Demjanic died in 2012, a month shy of his 92nd birthday without ever having served his sentence. But his case marked an important precedent in German legal history. For the first time, German prosecutors argued that SS guards, you know, the little guys, the guys who were just following orders, were just as culpable in the deaths of their prisoners as the big guns, the planners, the Hitlers, and the Himmlers, and the Eichmanns. But by then, the world had mostly moved on. After all, it had been almost 65 years since the Holocaust. No one outside of his family or his legal team thought much about Demjanic or Ivan the Terrible. There's an old Hebrew curse, Yamach Shemo, may his name be erased. And for a few years, until the Netflix documentary dug up the past, Demjanic's name was, if not erased, then at least mostly forgotten. So that's the insane story of the Demjanic trial. And here are your five fast facts. Number one, in 1977, the United States stripped a seemingly ordinary guy named John Demjanic of his citizenship alleging that he'd been an SS guard at the Treblinka extermination camp. Number two, at Israel's request, the U.S. extradited Demjanic to stand trial in Israel for crimes against humanity. The star of his defense team was a flashy and controversial attorney named Yoram Sheftel, who took on the case out of sheer contrariness, much to the disgust of his fellow citizens. Number three, every moment of the Demjanic trial was recorded and broadcast to a rapt Israeli public. The eyewitness testimony was particularly harrowing, and though Demjanic steadfastly maintained his innocence, all three judges, as well as most Israelis, found him guilty, sentencing him to death in 1988. Number four, but the sentence was never carried out. When the USSR dissolves in 1991, a treasure trove of documents from the Soviet archives introduced enough doubt about Demjanic's identity to overturn his conviction in Israel. After nearly a decade in an Israeli prison, he returned to the U.S. and campaigned for his citizenship to be restored. And number five. But Demjanic had only a couple of years to enjoy his restored American citizenship before it was stripped for a second and final time, again on grounds that he'd served as an SS guard. In 2009, Demjanic was deported to Germany, where he was indicted and convicted of being an accessory to over 28,000 murders. He died in 2012 while appealing his case. Those are your five fast facts, but here's one enduring lesson as I see it. Grappling with genocide is a process, and not always a graceful one. Just a couple years after the war, the U.S. was wooing former Nazis into NASA and the CIA. As difficult as it is to stomach, while these guys were really bad dudes, they were also really useful in the fight against the USSR. And really... Didn't that serve the greater good? Even Israel recruited former Nazis in the fight against Egypt. Links to all of this in the show notes. Moral dilemmas are one thing, survival is another. And the struggle was even harder on a personal level. It took more than a decade for Israelis to begin letting go of some of the shame and disgust they felt towards Holocaust survivors. For 13 years, Israelis refused to listen to survivors, but all that changed with the Eichmann trial of 61. At last, survivors were allowed to tell their stories. At last, Israelis could really listen to those stories without judgment or anger, marveling at their fellow citizens' resilience and their strength. The entire trial was a sort of collective catharsis. The moment that Israelis opened up to the possibility that the Jewish people were survivors, not merely victims. And all of this happened on the world stage. Finally, the entire world began to understand a fraction of what the Jewish people had suffered. And the entire world saw, as the man who implemented the final solution was tried, 
convicted and sentenced to death by the people he tried to annihilate. There was no doubt about who Eichmann was or what he had done, but there was some doubt about Demyanyuk. And so Israel did something painful and difficult. The Supreme Court let him go, understanding perhaps that human judgment is no match for, well, whatever is beyond us. That killing this old man might not serve the cause of justice. What would serve the cause of justice? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think it's my place to decide. That's up to the people who were there. But there are fewer and fewer of them every day. Soon there won't be any survivors left. But it's not just the survivors who are leaving us. It's also the men and the women on the other side. The ones who carried out the orders. Who herded prisoners into gas chambers with bayonets and manned the engines that released the poison gas. Did they take with them all hope of justice? Of forgiveness? Who was left to face justice or to dole it out? Who is left to forgive? I don't know the answer to that. But I know this. We weren't there. And we can never, ever stand in judgment of someone who was. But we can honor their legacy. Like the survivor Yosef Cherny, we can carry the legacy of the six million buried in Europe who will ask us, what did you do for us? And like Yosef Cherny, we can say to them only, I did my best. We do our best by remembering. We do our best by telling their stories, by staring their murderers in the face, by recounting their crimes, by knowing the names of the places they were killed, Flossenburg and Treblinka and Sobibor and Majdanek and Belzic and Kumno and Auschwitz and Dachau. And by remembering the stories of fierce resistance, like the resistance of Emmy Kortizos, whose son Rudolf testified against Emyanik during his 2009 trial in Germany. The Nazis had picked Emmy up in a routine sweep and herded her on a train to Germany where they promised she'd be given work. Before the train pulled out of the station, taking Emmy to her death, she tossed a letter out the window, hoping someone in her family would find it. She told her husband and children, I promise you I will be tough and I will definitely survive. Hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. Many kisses. Emmy was not able to fulfill her promise, but her son Rudolf, who was 70 years old in 2009, did his best to fulfill his promise to her. Our promise to the Jews who came before us, who were murdered simply for being Jews. Remember, each life was an entire universe. We owe it to them to tell their stories. So those two sides of me I mentioned at the beginning, I'm still grappling with it. Even as I grapple, I feel it is my obligation to tell these stories no matter what, to understand the Jewish psyche, to understand Israel, to understand the Jewish people. Thank you all for listening. Now it's time for our final segment, Israel Nerd Talk, where we highlight one of you, our amazing listeners. This week, meet Eitan, who wrote to us about the first episode of last season, which was about Ma'alot. If you haven't listened to it, well, let's just say, it's intense. Anyway, Eitan wrote, Hi Noam. Hi Eitan. I wanted to drop a personal note of thanks. Listening to each episode of Unpacking Israeli History has been a fantastic experience. I've been wrestling with how to pull my thoughts together about the Ma'alot episode, since my own relationship with it is rather complicated. My family moved to Israel in 73 from the USSR. One day in 74, while my parents were at work, my Yemeni nanny and her husband were looking after me news came that terrorists were throwing children out of the school window. My nanny's husband took me under the bed with a butcher's knife and hid there with me to keep me safe. While a Yemeni father was protecting me, Yemeni children were being massacred less than 50 miles away. I'm still piecing together what this means and how to contextualize the sacrifices of so many and the reminder of how close everyone in Israel always is to these kinds of events. Thanks for shining a light on this and on so many issues and keep up the good work. Eitan, I'm so glad you and your loved ones are safe. But it's terrifying to think about how personal this all felt to you. You're right, no one in Israel is too far removed from this type of experience. Thank you, Eitan, for writing in and sharing this story with us. And I'll say, just like I always say, if you, you listening, you have thoughts, you have comments, ruminations, whatever to share, don't hesitate. Be like Eitan. 
contact me at noam at jewishunpacked.com. Unpacking Israeli History is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related. This episode was produced by Rifki Stern. Our team for this episode includes the great writer Adi Elbaz and Rob Perra. I'm your host, Noam Weissman. Thanks for listening. See you next week. The news cycle is an endless stream of anxiety and it can feel hard to breathe through it. Being Jewish in 2024 is stressful. There's no denying that. But I've got great news for you. The Unpacked podcast team has teamed up with the Institute for Jewish Spirituality to create soulful Jewish living. It's the perfect antidote for your racing brain and will help you overcome the stressors that stand in your way. I can tell you that personally, it's been invaluable to me over the last few difficult months. In each episode, Rabbi Josh Fagelson uses ancient wisdom and modern mindfulness practices to help center your soul and ease you into the week. Be brave, close those eyes, take a deep breath, and tune in. Find Soulful Jewish Living wherever you listen to podcasts.